Good evening, Dr. Karpacki. How are you tonight? Wonderful, Dr. Stewart. Thank you for the uh, intro and the opportunity. Yeah, we're very happy to have you here. You're one of the fan favorites. So um, we're excited to kick off almost the beginning of the year. Um, we had some great webinars last week. And if, if anyone on here joined us over the weekend, we had an eight hour oral pharma weekend, which was a, a huge success. So thank you to everybody who joined us for that. But without further ado, I am going to get started because I know that we have a lot to hear. So welcome. I'm your host, Dr. Jennifer Stewart. And it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Karpecki once again to Wu Yu. Um, Dr. Karpecki is the Director of Corneal and External Disease uh, at the Kentucky Eye Institute and is an Associate Professor at the Kentucky College of Optometry, University of Pikeville. Thank you, Jen. You're welcome. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Always an honor to get to be here. You guys do such a great job. Everything's so well organized, so professional, uh, you know, world class. And uh, I'm honored, but I'm especially thankful to those who are attending. I, it's a busy time of year. We're just in the first day of February, you know, got through the first month of the year of uh, hopefully you're all doing well and having a good start to the year. And here you are on a program. So thank you for doing that. Uh, these are my financial disclosures, companies to research with, advisory boards, speakers, bureaus, um, as listed there. Okay, so we've mitigated those financial relationships as put into that, and now we're going to get into this survival guide. I will, I'll apologize or I'll preface this by telling you, I put too many slides in this, so it's going to go fast. Uh, we're going to hit each one, but a lot of them are build slides too, and some are just, hey, you need this as a survival guide if you're going to get into ocular surface disease management in everyday practice, which means IOL management, management, contact lens co-management, expectacle remakes. The number one reason for that is ocular surface disease. So it'll help you in everything you do in practice as far as a survival guide when it comes to the ocular surface disease. Now, I might have taken it a little far when I got into some of the algorithms, but I, I meant to do that just to kind of tell you that you do have to kind of look at which type of dry eye is out there because they have to be treated differently. And one time I just put up the algorithms of where you treat and I got a whole bunch of uh, very nice email, actually they're always kind that are saying, hey, that was great, but what do you mean for each category? What treatments would you put in? So I added those in and I'm still gonna try to do it in the next 50 minutes. I can go through these slides fast. Dry eye is common. Some people suggest 60 to 80 million people have this. Numbers are going up because of digital devices. There's no way they won't. We, we blink, what, one fourth the time when we're on digital device? Blinking cleans the eyelids because actually it's a scissor reflex. It pumps the meibomian glands. It pulls up the lipid and tears. So you get prevention of evaporation. And if you don't blink enough, you evaporate faster. So it's no surprise we're seeing these kind of numbers, 30 to 50 million based on longitudinal studies. Uh, we do a good job. Optometry sees more than 90% of all comprehensive eye exams. We diagnose the majority of ocular surface disease and dry eye. And really 16 to 18 million is a lot because you're not going to get that many in eye exams every year. So we're doing a good job. But now we got to get into, hey, what kind of impact does this have? Where does it fit in? What do we need to look for? And I think I love this practicality here that basically says symptoms of dryness and discomfort are obviously highly prevalent. But here's the key thing. Fifth, up to 50% of contact lens wearers cite dry eye, dryness, and discomfort is the number one reasons to discontinue contact lens. I don't know if I ever thought that number was that high. I was just going to think, well, one in five, one in six. No, it's 50%. And 59% of contact lenses were, uh, contact lens wearers were found to have clinically significant MGD. Now, how do you determine clinically significant MGD? You have to express the oil glands. It's just this lower eyelid. I mean, like nasal to central is the only region that you really have to express. And we're going to talk about how easy that is. I know for a lot of people who are in everyday practice, which is what this, the title I was given, you know, survival guide and ocular surface disease for everyday practice uh, aren't going to be expressing glands, but I do want to encourage you to, because 72 to 78% of the time, well, I'm giving you two questions in this very early slide, 72 to 78% of patients have what's called non-obvious meibomian gland dysfunction, meaning some have caps, some have other things, but the other, the 72 to 78% do not have any signs unless you press on the oil glands. I've had, you know, I had one resident once say to me, you know, Dr. Picky, I like this dry stuff, but like, I'd like to do it, but do I have to express the oil glands? Well, 86% of all dry eye have some meibomian gland dysfunction. So that's like saying, you know, I, I want to manage macular degeneration, but do I have to look at the macula? 
you know, it's this is 86% of dry eye. You have to learn to express or you're going to miss 75% of the cases. And look at the impact on contact lens wears. If we go one step further, which is, you know, just number of conditions. Uh, contact lens wears 50%. Remember that number. Patients with diabetes, 54% of them have clinically significant dry eye disease. And glaucoma patients, mainly because of prostaglandin analogs or preservatives, have dry eye, 59, almost 60%. Uh, what's really interesting is there's a study by Macon that showed that 96%, 96% of patients on glaucoma medications had meibomian gland dysfunction. Now, you have to have meibomian gland dysfunction for a long time before it becomes immune-mediated dry eye. But what that means is the sooner you preempt it, the sooner you treat it, blepharitis, MGD, dry eye, you're going to have greater success. It also impacts cataract co-management. 63% of clinical cataract surgical patients had a tear breakup time of less than five. You think, you know, maybe 25, 30%, no, more than half. This is one of my favorite studies. The second one down there, these were patients who they measured osmolarity. You don't necessarily have to do that in a survival guide for dry eye, but, but those who are really into dry eye, will find it to be invaluable. You can't probably do a lot without, at least I find it so valuable if you're dedicated to that area. And, and I, we have a busy clinic. I see about 55 patients a day. You don't, you can see a lot of patients if you don't have to dilate them or refract them or do anything else, which is my situation with these dry eye patients. So they, they measured that osmolarity and they found that the patients who scored an abnormal amount, 17% um, of those missed their IOL calculation by more than a diopter. Some were as much as four and a half diopters. Can you imagine going into cataract surgery, expecting a planar result, coming out plus 450, just because someone missed the dry eye. It has that kind of impact. And is dry eye common? Well, if you look at the cataract patients, this study is pretty powerful. 81% of people who came in for a cataract evaluation. Now, these were patients already in, in this case, the ophthalmology practice doing the cataract surgery, but some were referred from optometry colleagues. So it was a mix of patients being sent in. I'd like to think most were in their clinic because 54% had level three dry eye. That is confluent, central, patchy, major staining. Uh, level four is, you know, whole cornea, probably more neurotrophic keratitis. Uh, level two, which is again, significant corneal staining, uh, you know, even confluent in areas is 23.5. Level one is just a few little areas was 8.1% and zero was only 11. So here's the interesting thing. 81% had some significant level, level two or higher dry eye disease diagnosis. And these are the ITF guidelines. They were guidelines on dry eye that were published 25 years ago. Probably not what we would read as use as much today. I'm not putting them down because I was on the ITF task force. We just didn't know that much 25 years ago. In fact, if you read that original publication, it says that lid margin disease was the least most common form of dry eye disease. Today, we know it's 86% <laughs> dry eye. Boy, were we off back then. So it just goes shows you if all the experts could be that wrong 20 years ago, hey, we all get an excuse as far as this survival guide for ocular surface disease. But here's the point, 81% had significant clinical dry eye, only 22, remember that number, 22% were diagnosed with that going into the exam. So we, we do miss a lot um, and we know the impact of missing it. So it's a great opportunity to say, okay, let's look at a survival day, survival guide for everyday practice. If I had to tell you what's the most important thing you could do if you're really getting into this and you're seeing so many you know full exams and, and you're, you're, you're the, the key optometrist that's doing, because I mean, optometry, 94% of all comprehensive eye exams are performed by optometry. So that is our bread and butter. Where do you start? So you start with the eyelid. That's the beginning. Um, if you see something like frothy tear film, what a wonderful indicator for my bomian gland dysfunction. In fact, it's an automatic diagnosis. There's nothing else that I know of does this. And the reason why you get this frothiness is because you've got bad lipids, and they react with the enzymes that are in bacteria, which is called a biofilm or early blepharitis. And that reaction causes what's called saponification. And yep, you got it, soap in the eye. And that's why you see frothy tear film. It's probably also why these patients complain about burning and stinging and redness. That's what I would complain about if I had soap in my eyes too. So early diagnosis sometimes is as easy as looking for frothy tear film. That's, a, that's usually an earlier form of MGD. Now, what about a more advanced, not advanced, but a more chronic form, one that's been around a long time. Uh, how would you make look at the eyelid and see what pathology is there? 
So as you're looking at this eyelid, you're probably already picking up some significant pathology. And that's the level I would love for you to be at with every patient coming in. So I'm going to focus on these eyelids real carefully, and I'm going to look for pathology. So you've had about five seconds to 10 seconds to look at it. What pathologies did you see? Okay, let's see how many of these you got. Uh, one is telangiectatic vessels. That's an indication of ocular rosacea or chronic inflammation. But when you get those blood vessels, you're going to get a lot more of an inflammatory response. What else is present? Well, if I look at this, I also see these capped glands. You'll also notice where those glands are. They're very posterior in the eyelid. When you get that posterior, you're really talking about chronicity. You know, my bone glands usually start anterior to middle and they move back. Maybe because the eyelid's thickening, maybe that's just what happens with progression, but that is extremely posterior. Patients probably had this for decades. Collarettes. Now, normally we look for collarettes, the upper eyelid, because it's easier to see them, but they're present to the lower eyelid. You know, you got a fairly advanced case of demodex. Debris in the tear film. That was subtle. I wonder how many people picked that one up. I'm not sure how to pick that one up, except by looking at this picture real carefully later. Thickening of the eyelids, tylosis. Um, scallop lid margins. It's hard to see that from this angle, but those really are little scallops, not extreme. But the ultimate way of picking up on the collarettes, which we talked about earlier, is to have the patient look down. Now, remember that because that's really important in your diagnosis. I think most of the collarettes indicative or pathognomonic for demodex blepharitis are hard to see. Here's an example. I'm looking at that upper eyelid. I mean, I'm seeing a few crazy, you know, displaced lashes. So that's one indicator. I'm seeing a couple places where they're missing. That's another indicator. But it's hard for me to see the collarettes. But when I have the patient look down, oh, now I see those clear sleeves, white sleeves right at the base of the lashes. That's where it is. And why is it at the base of the lashes? Because that's where Demodex resides. It loves to be in the follicles. Demodex follicularum loves the lash follicles. Demodex brevis loves the meibomian glands and, se and seborrheic glands. So that's where the two, and those are the only two forms that, that affect uh, humans. Uh, so anyways, you can see that that's in that follicle and that's why you get all the extrusion of material uh, and all you know the stuff that's left over that comes out and that's called a collarette because it's at the base of the lashes like a sleeve. So again, you know, I'm gonna go up in the imaging here and I'm gonna look at that same patient's upper eyelid. And, and yeah, I am seeing some atherosis. I'm seeing some displaced lashes, but it's only when they look down that I'm able to see these collarettes real clearly, especially in the more subtle cases. Now, it's not as subtle as I thought when I increased the magnification. It's almost every lash has a tiny little collarette. So it's extremely frequent. Many lashes are missing and sparse, all caused by demodex. And that's why I tell patients, even those who are asymptomatic, we need to treat this because eventually you're gonna lose those lashes. They're gonna get thin. You're gonna get immune mediated dry eye or chronic dry eye because it's gonna get in the meibomian glands and on and on it goes. I also said expression is critical. I like to use the Mistrota paddle. It's an easy little tool to use. I've had one for over two decades or over 12 years now, two decades, forget that, for about 12 years, because she sent me one of the first ones that she was working with. Um, I've been practicing in dry eye, dedicated dry eye for more than two decades. So maybe that's where I was going. But you place this behind the eyelid. You gently, you keep your thumb on the outside of the eyelid and you gently lift up the um the, the paddle. You don't need anesthetic. You're just trying to see what comes out with a little pressure. It should come out like olive oil. That would be normal. Abnormal would be discolored or, or turbid. More abnormal would be gelatinous, but clear toothpaste and white would be even more abnormal. In a worst case scenario, you can't get anything out. You don't have to express temporal glands. They don't work that well on humans. You don't have to express the upper eyelid. That's tougher to do. Mybography is valuable up there because sometimes you get different imaging. But as far as expression is just that lower nasal to central region. Uh, so here's a patient coming in with a lot of makeup and I'm gonna go ahead and uh, take the paddle, place it behind the eyelid and gently push up. It takes about three seconds. I've got my answers. That's probably taste-like to, so I'd say that's a, in my scale, um, you know, three's normal. I have a backward scale because that's the way the original research was. So I call this a one, like a little strand of toothpaste coming out, maybe a one plus, but that's not normal. And I don't know that you even need to grade it. I think you just need to know what normal is. Normal is clear olive oil that just comes out. Then you need a good methodology for dry eye management. And you look at this and think, I thought you were gonna make this simple. It's supposed to be a survival guide. Actually, this is simple if you delve into it. I know anytime you hear TFOS dues to 
you think, uh oh, it's going to be, and it is 52 pages. I'm going to save you reading 52 pages from this uh, publication. So this is the committee I was on. Uh, it was kind of fun being part of this because they, they included real world clinicians besides these brilliant researchers that had always been involved. And so they, they made it a lot more practical because of it. Uh, you start with some triaging questions. You look at risk factors. You have to have a symptom and a sign to be dry eye. So we're going to talk about where, how to get those. And then you differentiate the type of dry eye. That's really the whole thing you're seeing here. My favorite triaging questions that we start there are some that came from the Dry Eye Summit in Denver back in 2014. Hard to believe that was a decade ago. But this was very insightful. If you had your front office desk ask these five questions or your technician or you ask them, you're going to get a lot of dry eye, but you're going to get a lot less con spectacle remakes, a lot less contact lens dropouts, a lot less IOL miscalculations. So it is a valuable thing to ask. And they're basically, how do your eyes feel? How do they look? Like, are they red? Do you experience fluctuating vision or blurred vision? Do you have the urge to use artificial tears or re-wetting drops? And then the last one's how much time you spend on digital devices. Unfortunately, everybody spends way too much time on them. But at least it, it ties into the fact that digital device use and dry eye go together. So we're trying to assess the level of where of what you use. So those five are wonderful, but you will get a lot of patience if you start using those five, especially at the front desk when they're when they're taking the calls. That's when it'd be a great time to ask. And then you could flag those patients, but you will get a lot. Next, you want risk factors. I think you all would know the risk factors of dry eye, systemic medications like antihistamines, topical medications like glaucoma meds. Contact lens wear is a risk factor, as is ocular surgery. Uh, age, gender are risk factors that play a role. Systemic diseases, in fact, the most common systemic disease with dry eye in it is thyroid disease. Second is diabetes. Third are autoimmune conditions. Uh, you know, high correlation would be things like Sjogren's, but, but common correlations are thyroid, diabetes, and your arthritis and lupus type categories. The environment, if you live in Arizona or Colorado or in the deserts, you're gonna get a lot more uh, dry eye than you are gonna get if you're in a very moist area like typical Seattle, although lately it's been dry there too. Digital device use, smoking, anterior segment diseases. In fact, demodex blepharitis is a common dry eye association. So if you see that, you can almost count on there being some level of MGD in most patients. I also like this middle diagnostic test because it says you need a symptom and you need a sign. And you know, that makes a lot of sense because if you only had signs, patient comes in with grade four staining and says, you know, my eyes are a little blurry. That's not dry eye, that's neurotrophic keratitis. That's from HSV in one eye, diabetes in, in both eyes, you know, previous stroke, surgeries, stuff like that. So symptoms have to be there. And then you want to look at a sign to correlate it. Some people say just, you know, questionnaires. That's a handy way to do it, DEQ5. I like the speed questionnaire and the DEQ5 more than OSDI. I think OSDI is better for research maybe, but it just gives you an idea of, of if they have the dry eye or you can just ask them in their history. And then according to TFOS dues too, you got to do one of these things. I'd say do two. Osmolarity, if you're really into dry eye, is a great tool. But tear breakup time, which you see over to your left, or ocular surface staining. Those are the two I'd recommend if you're talking about a course for everyday dry eye because you don't need to do all the advanced things at that stage. Uh, so uh, the best way to look at tear breakup time is to glance at it. I don't sit there and time it on a stopwatch. I, I know it's kind of quick, four seconds, five seconds. The great thing about fluorescein is you put the fluorescein in, you see the breakup time, you see staining on the cornea, you see staining on the conjunctiva if you also purchase a number 1515 yellow rat and filter. They can get them off Amazon, but photography shops, I tell you, when I use my number 15 yellow rat and filter, and I put it between the patient and the slit lamp, not, not up front, uh, the, between the patient and the slit lamp, that image at the top right is fluorescein. I mean, that looks better than any lysamine, and lysamine is expensive and hard to get. It's better than any lysamine image I've ever seen. So with my rat and filter, I get conch staining, corneal staining, tear breakup time, and a really important one called the tear meniscus height. People don't typically do Shermer's, at least I don't in my clinic for a long time now. I know some Sjogren's panels require it, but, but that's because they just don't know better. Tear meniscus height is way better to determine an aqueous fissioned, or deficient dry eye than, than is a Shermer. So that is taken over. Okay, now you know it's dry eye. Like for example, 
breakup time is going to be fast if you have Sjogren's or if you have rosacea with evaporative dry eye, it, it's going to be quick. There's no way you would subtype them by just looking at breakup time. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference. You probably might not be able to tell the difference with early staining either. So, the, so that just told you you had dry eye and symptoms doesn't necessarily tell you the staining because sometimes your most severe dry eye patients, their nerves have downregulated and you have the least symptoms. So that's why after you know it's dry eye because of symptoms and one or two of these signs, breakup and staining, now you're saying, okay, what kind do I have? Well, the best test for evaporative, that means your meibomian glands are not working well, evaporative dry eye, is to do what? Well, it's right there at the top. That's expression. That's what that's showing. Again, you got to press on the oil glands. Unless you see one of those signs, like 28% of the time, signs show up. But for the other 72 plus, you got to push on the nasal to central zone, see what's coming out with your fingers, with a Q-tip, with a paddle, that's even easier. You kind of do it that way. Um, we've already shown you videos of how easy it is to place it behind the eyelid. Now, how do you know if it's aqueous deficient? Well, I gave you that earlier too. The best test for aqueous deficiency is no longer Shermer's. It's to look at that tear height. And again, I, I, I don't look at, you know, the height. I don't measure it. I don't get out calipers. I don't, you know, there are systems that, that have the, the ability to measure all these for you. They're terrific. But in clinical practice, if I get fluorescein in there, I'm just going to glance at it. And I know that's not normal. If you look at a bunch of normal patients, you'll recognize very quickly normal from abnormal. That looks pretty scant. There is an aqueous deficient component there. So just as a summary to diagnosis, if you look at all of uh, what we're dealing with as far as our options here, you, you start with symptoms and then you do one of these three, I said two, ocular surface staining and breakup. You glance at breakup and you're like, okay, I know you have dry eye because you have symptoms. You had some predisposing factors we went over earlier. Your triaging questions flagged you. And now I need to know what type you have. The way I know the type is to express or to look at the tear height. So this is a great summary. It's simple. In fact, sometimes people will used to come into my office and visit and they'd be like, I thought you have a real complex clinic. And, and I do. I have over 800 positive diagnosed Sjogren's syndrome patients in my clinic. I think it's the largest in the, in the country. And I don't say that to brag. It's just my numbers. We've been, I've been at this for 27 years. I should. Uh, I trained under Don Korb. I've had a lot of great mentors ahead way back when that allowed me to go in the right direction. So you think, okay, that must be a complex this is kind of my algorithm. I don't, I don't do anything much more. Now it's not in the right order because quite frankly, I'm not going to express after fluorescein. So I'd start with symptoms. I'd look at that eyelid real carefully, including expression in, in order. I'd have the patient look down to look for colorettes. I'd put the fluorescein in with the number 15 yellow rat and filter and I could glance at the break of time. I'm not going to time it, but I could tell it's quick. I look for corneal staining, conjunctival staining and the tear height. Based on that, I know what's going on. If the tear height's really low, there's an aqueous deficient component. If the expression is perfect, then there's only aqueous or mucin deficient. If the expression is not good, then that's evaporative, especially if the tear height's normal. So you could get a lot just by putting it together. But on occasion, there are other types of dry eye. There's one called, I call it exposure related, where patients have an inadequate lid seal. And this is a core blacky light test where you take a pen light in a dark lane, have the patient close their eyes like they're sleeping, put the pen light here, and you will see a bright beam of light coming down like that Ohio State patient on the right. We're not going to be doing well with that kind of opening down below. So wonderful little test. Uh, fantastic for this. But quite frankly, you would know if they had this because they'd be the only patients who talk about symptoms in the morning. That's why it's so important to ask, when are your symptoms worse? Because if they say in the morning, it's not dry eye. Dry eye gets worse as the day goes on, especially evaporative. But if it's only in the morning or worse in the morning, that's inadequate lid seal. That's exposure keratitis resulting in dry eye. So there are actually four subtypes. I know you didn't want me to get complex for this course, but if I just told you there were two, I, I'd be lying. There's evaporative caused by my Bowman gland dysfunction. There's aqueous deficient. That's the, the thin tear meniscus. There's mucin deficient. How do you get that one? Well, the goblet cells that make mucin are on the conjunctiva. So if we go back, I know it's a little ways back, but let's go back here. Oh, there it is. Top right. That's mucin deficient. You get that level of staining of the conjunctiva. That is completely mucin deficient. Although you might also get, you know, mucin strands. You, you, you may actually get filamentary keratitis if it gets bad. And then the exposure, the inadequate lid seal I just showed you at the end. And then each one has its own sort of treatment. For example, a person who has an evaporative dry eye will typically have a blocked glands, obstructed glands. And that's we talked about why it's so important to 
express the lower eyelid, nasal to central. You gotta see what's coming out of there. That's why we look so closely at the eyelid, for telangic tasia, thickening, cap gland, scalloped eyelid margins, debris in the tear film. Collarettes is the blepharitis. That's the important one there. And more often it's demodex. According to the Titan study, 58% of people that go into an optometric or ophthalmology practice have demodex blepharitis. They have collarettes. The only thing you can have if you have collarettes is demodex blepharitis. Uh, inflammation, that's a natural response to the blepharitis or to the obstructed glands. And then you have an abnormal tear film. So you're saying, well, yeah, that all makes sense. Well, that's the key is you've got to treat these things. The obstruction you would have. So in other words, if I just went in and said, I'm going to give you cyclosporin, that means I'm treating column three. That patient's not going to get much better. Not because cyclosporin doesn't work. In fact, there's newer ones now that are excellent. But because I'm only treating one element, I'm, I'm leaving the causes of the inflammation, the obstructed glands, the demodex blepharitis, you know, or if I just treat the tear film, artificial tears, I'm missing three more important things. So you might have to do a contact lens patient with evaporative dry eye, meaning you express the glands, didn't look good. Probably a hydrating compress. You probably have to do a treatment for the eyelids, depending on, especially colorettes, that's demodex. You're probably gonna need the new lodolan or 0.25%. Inflammation, if it's really bad, you might start with steroid, but typically it's like sporin, maybe an omega fatty acid. And tear film, you could start with artificial tears, the new perfluorohexyl octane, but something that gets at each one without getting too complex. Why do a lot of people do IPL? Well, it helps with obstruction. It helps with inflammation. So people get at least two of the categories there. So speaking of which, one of the newest medications that come out is perfluorohexyl octane. It's a single ingredient drop that is 100% perfluorohexyl octane. No preservatives in it. Um, very, very good profile. No, no, it's water-free, so you don't have to worry about preserves, obviously steroid-free. But it, this neat thing about this is it actually works four times better at preventing evaporation than healthy human myba. I mean, can you think of a drug that actually works better than our body at its top level of functioning physiology? That's what this does, four times better. The study involved comparing healthy human myba on top of saline to healthy human uh, myba with perfluorohexyl octane versus just perfluorohexyl octane over top of the saline as well. There were four columns control in those three. And it was four times better than healthy human mybum at preventing evaporation. It's the only drug um, other than, I mean, for dry eye, obviously for demodex blepharitis, we had a drug that did this exact same thing, hit its primary endpoints in two studies. But these are only drugs that have ever hit approval in only two studies, meaning hitting signs in this case for dry eye is the only one, hit signs and symptoms and then repeated it. Only one person out of 614 in this trial discontinued. Three out of 614 mentioned burning, only three. And 13 out of 614 in the trial mentioned a temporary mild blurry, blurriness. I notice that when I put it in, I get a little blur for a few seconds, then I get really clear vision. Clinical data, obviously very statistical at day 15 and at day 57. Here's the tolerability, the, the zero adverse events that are serious. One person out of 614 discontinued, three out of 614 had burning, and 13 out of 614 had any sort of a blurred vision. So it is very different. Very, big disadvantage this drop, if there is one, it's so comfortable, it's hard to know it went in the eye. And the drop is one fourth of a normal drop size. So that plays a role. Then I want you to look at the eyelids. New studies have come out. This Hank Perry study is really pretty impressive to me. It showed that 93% of patients with evaporative dry eye have some sort of biofilm, either bacteria or demodex. That's where IPLs, without going into them at this point, work well. The telangiectatic vessels, they activate the mitochondria through the cytochrome C pathway. This would be a great candidate for IPL. Look at the telangiectatic vessels and the cap glands. Now we get into demodex. Now this is a very severe case of blepharitis, but this is the most common form of blepharitis that we know of. Uh, it's in fact 58% of all comers walking into our offices. There are options. There are blue masks and red masks, but these are not covered. Blue mask does work for this by insurance. Hordeola often, I think the number one reason for Hordeola in my clinical experience is demodex blepharitis. Notice all the collarettes at the base of the lashes in that top image with the Hordeola. And even in this one here, and then it's just fascinating. 
Uh, we're not going to LLLT too much today, but I want to get into Demodex blepharitis and what it is. It's a common eyelid margin disease, as we said, the most common form of blepharitis. Characterized pathognomonic means that if you see this, this is the only thing it can be. Pathognomonic, the collarettes, the sleeves at the base of the lashes, the white little things at the base of the lashes, either clear or white, means Demodex blepharitis. 25 million people in the U.S. should have this. It should be 58% of all people that come into our offices when you have patients looking down at the slit lamp to look for it. And there's two forms. We talked about this earlier, follicularum and brevis. Brevis loves to get into sebaceous glands. That's why you see it in a lot of rosacea patients. Meibomian glands. Uh, it gets in the follicles, the follicularum form, like the lashes. Those are pretty disgusting pictures, but they really pretty much do describe what's going on. It's the most common ecto uh, parasite on the human body uh, by far. And uh, it over accumulates or overpopulates in a lot of patients. Uh, in fact, the, the this drug, which we're gonna talk about first came out of veterinary medicine. In fact, dogs, dogs who have mange, that's just Demodex infestation. What's amazing is this drug has pretty much eradicated Demodex in the veterinary population in dogs. And now we have an eye drop form that's very comfortable, tolerable, that we're going to talk about as well. But here's the Triton, st or the Titan study. 1,032 patients went into OD and MD offices. 58% of them had Demodex blepharitis. 59% the dry disease. You know why? Because there's an overlap between those conditions. And that's probably why those numbers are there. And keep putting in the questions in the chat. I will get to them, I promise. Uh, so in the Titan study, 51% of patients with contact lenses had cholerets, pathognomonic for demodex blepharitis. 56% of cataract patients, 60% of dry eye patients, 65% of glaucoma. Almost seven out of 10 cases of blepharitis are demodex. And of course, 57% of those with MGD. And the reason why this becomes such a problem is that Demodex has three ways of causing disease. Mechanical, those little Demodex mites can actually scratch and tear and, and cause all kinds of problems as they claw. They have like, I guess, four claws in, in terms of their two in the top, two in the other side. They carry bacteria on their surface. So that's why you see 93% of all of operative dry eye patients have some sort of bacteria, especially those with Demodex. And then there's that chemical digestive enzymes um, Demodex is a weird little organism. It actually it has an anus, but no one knows if it works. So we don't know if the digestive enzymes just explode out of it at some point, or when it dies, they come out, but it results in inflammation to the eyelid margins and the surrounding tissue. So the first ever drug approved for this just happened a few months ago as well, called Lodolan or 0.25%. It works by the GABA inhibition pathway to just paralyze the mite. That's how it, it works. Look at this eradication rates. Vehicle didn't really do much. But look at 20 hours. And again, this is ex vivo. They took the mites out, put it on a plate, put the uh, low to lander 0.25% on them. 20 hours gone, finished. Now we're going to talk about dosing in human. And here's some of the study results in that patient population, a pretty typical response at day 28. Now I find my patients, when I have them put the drop in the eye, they're supposed to be BID for six weeks. And I love the fact that it's six weeks. I tell patients, this is a cure. You don't have to stay on it like all your other dry eye medications. It is six weeks and you're done. And the patient will come back in a week or two and say, it's the best my eyes have ever felt. Because I have them put the drop in the eye and it's a 40 microliter drop. That's the average size of any drop other than some of the newer ones we talked about. And you just rub the excess into your lash. And these patients within a week or two are looking amazing because I've had some of them come back early. But I have to tell them, you can't stop there even though you look great. You can't save the bottle. The mite has a, it's adult stage is only about five to seven days. And that's when it lays the eggs. So here's what happens is the, the mite has a two and a half week life cycle, including that adult stage. So if you stop after three weeks, guess what? The eggs hatch and it all comes back. So you have to get both life cycles. You have to treat for six solid weeks, even though it might clear in a week or two. Twice a day is not a lot to ask. Six weeks and you're done. And who knows how many will be back. Maybe some of the early studies showed that over 65% of the patients at a year were still clear. And they didn't get to rub this into their lashes at the end after they put it in their eye. But I do want them putting it in the eye the way it's prescribed because I do want it to get into the glands and into the follicles. But any excess drop there, you go ahead and place it at the base of the lashes where the cholerets are. This is the phase two trial, but look at the cholerate cure rates. 96% versus the vehicle at 14, mite eradication rates, 84 
otherwise. Saturn one and two, these were the pivotal trials. Look at the number of patients with two or less colorets. I mean, average patient had a hundred lashes in this clinical trial with colorets. To get to two is an incredibly high bar, especially when they weren't allowed to actually rub their eyes or use any scrubs. And look at that, almost 40, 44% of the patients compared to 7% of the vehicle achieved that. And then Saturn two, 55% versus 12. That always amazes me because of the fact that we're using it even more effectively now by having the excess get to the site we want it to get to. It's a multi-dose drop. It lasts the entire six weeks. Um, it paralyzes and kills the mite and eradicates them. It's twice a day for six weeks and you're done. Colorette cure, mite eradications, and secondary endpoints like redness, erythe you know, erythema scores are all clinically significantly improved over the vehicle. And the only most common side effect was mild transient stinging in less than 10% of patients. Other things you want to use, we talked about this. Omega fatty acids are a handy treatment. But if you ever wonder why a lot of the fish oil studies never showed significant improvement, I think fish oil is good for the heart, good for the skin. There's no downside to it. But I think if you really want to look at research on this, GLA is the key ingredient with fish oil. There are seven controlled clinical trials showing effects in aqueous deficient dry eye, post-PRK dry eye, Sjogren's syndrome dry eye, contact lens dry eye, my bombing gland dysfunction without dry eye, mild to moderate dry eye, and postmenopausal women. And some of these studies were like, you know, pre-specified sign and symptom endpoint studies. So my point to the last slide is there's a lot of things you can use, but when you're treating evaporative dry eye, meaning the oil glands are not working, you got to do something for the obstructed glands, something for the blepharitis, most commonly demodex, something for the inflammation until you get it controlled, and something for the tear film until they start producing really good tears on their own. Some of these newer things, which I focused on, work really well for the blepharitis, for the oil glands, for like the mybo, the uh, perforex loctanes, and of course the the lotolanner for the blepharitis. But there are other bat, you know, staples like omega fatty acids that can control inflammation as well. Aqueous deficient dry eye. Again, how do you know if it's aqueous deficient dry eye? You look at the tear meniscus. If it's really thin, that means you don't have the bulk of tears from the lacrimal glands, accessory lacrimal glands, so the volume's low. Two things to worry about here, because our oil glands are usually fine. It's only 14% of the population, but still, inflammation and tear volume. So you start thinking tear volume. Ooh, this is where punctal plugs are fantastic. Once you get the inflammation control, they're the best thing you could do for a lot of these patients. This is where your, your nasal sprays that produce tears are wonderful. So here's a patient with a really thin tear meniscus, patchy staining. That's probably Sjogren's when you see that pattern. Lodopredinol has been approved in low concentrations. Dry eye drinks. There's a new dry eye drink that recently came out that showed twice the absorption of water. That means if you took one of these packets, put it in a bottle of water, and you drank two bottles a day, it would be the equivalent of four bottles of regular plain water because of the absorption rates that were listed. Lots of good nutrients, uh, lots of components like taurine and anti-inflammatories and uh, creatine. You look at all this green tea extract, turmeric, natural anti-inflammatories, and the list goes on without sweeteners. Love punctal plugs again. I haven't said it for a while, but you have to choose the right patients. Your aqueous deficient, your mucin deficient are wonderful plug patients. And the way you know is you've treated the inflammation and the tear height's still really thin. Those are your best plug patients. I don't do service plugs anymore. I feel like they irritate. Patients come back and complain about them. And even if they work, they fall out. I love these 180 day plugs. They're so easy to put in. You basically have to have the right tools. You are going to need pair of forceps that have a groove in them. Because if you try jewelers, at least for me, they fly everywhere. So you'll need the right tools. That way you don't crush them or they don't fling off. And then you simply just lower the eyelid and place it into the proper place, the puncta. Then push it so it's under the surface. I might take the dilator at the end, push it down a little if I need to, but I want it in the vertical canal. That's the safest place for these plugs. Here's the newest technology. It's a tapered plug that's 0.2 millimeters at the end, meaning you get it in any patient's eye. The problem with the first one is if it, if it was too big, it wouldn't go in. And if it was too, and of course this is after dilation, if it was too small, uh, you wouldn't get a lot of blockage. This one starts tapered. And so you, it's the same material, but being tapered, I can get it into this tiny puncta and I can plug the whole thing now because it starts 0.2 and it goes up to 0.6. 
Uh, this one's going to last a good amount of time. And if I feel like I still have to do more, I might do you know something that plugs that lower but vertical canal area. This word here, stimulants, really helped. There's even a prescription medication. That last one was an external uh, tear stimulant that you place on this crease here. This one here is the spray that's approved. This again is a medication spray um, that you spray in behind this crease here. Look at the data on Varanaclean solution. I mean, this really stimulates, especially my Sjogren's patients, my aqueous deficient, they love this. It, it gets all the tear volume up to where it needs to be. It includes more of your natural tears. And there's really no substitute for your natural tears when you can produce that. This is where amniotic membrane for non-responders comes in. There's both dry and cryopreserved. Cryopreserved a little more powerful, but there's some dry forms that have a lot of anti-inflammatory. So I will choose one or the other, depending on the conditions I see. This is, you know, this is actually a, one of the dry forms that actually has a lot of these, but there's a couple extra things that only are in the cryopreserved form you can't get anywhere else. And you're wondering, why is he putting cryopreserved amniotic membrane in a survival guide basic course on dry eye? Because it's as easy as fitting a contact lens. And if you have the right patient, the patient who's SPK won't go away. This might be the only way to do it. And it's covered by insurance in those patients. And removal is easy too. You have All a patient look up. Oops, I didn't want to in there. You do that. You just grab the right forceps to grab the bottom of it and pull it out. So it's nothing any one of us here couldn't do. Um, next thing on, on this is that is the dry forms. Once again, have the patient's eye open at the slit lamp, place it over the eye. You can now apply a bandage lens, or you could even put that on the bandage lens and put it in the eye. Or in this patient, I, I couldn't get the bandage lens to work for him the first time. So I'm just going to lift the upper eyelid, place it over the top. And then I'm going to tape his eye closed for the next 48 hours. And I'm amazed by the response I'll get in the moderate severe forms for this as well. Then I use one of these seals that we'll talk about a little later. Autologous serum. The only thing you have to know about autologous serum is the concentration. And for the majority of patients, when you order these, there's these national outfits, and this is just showing you how, this is what I tell patients. You have what's called Sjogren's syndrome or KCS. Your lacrimal glands are scarred from this autoimmune disease. And the lacrimal glands have a lot of blood vessels running through them. It's called very vascularized. They take the serum from the blood vessels and they make tears. That's how all our tears are made. And in your case, you just don't make have enough. So we're going to get your blood drawn, take the serum out, just like your lacrimal glands would do, and make your own tears. Patients seem to get that. And look at how similar tears and serum are. Well, they're almost identical, other than serum has a little higher concentration. These national outfits will visit patients. The only thing they need to know is what concentration. Well, for most dry eye, 20 to 25%, remember those numbers, is the most common percentage. Graft versus host disease, I have a lot of those patients referred in. Neurotrophic keratitis, I got to go higher concentrations, like 40. Uh, SLK even, I need to go to 40, 40 to 50%. And hey, talk about the whole thing coming all the way around. If you fit scleral lenses, remember this course was about including contact lens wares. You actually have the ultimate treatment for dry eye. I don't know anything that works better than scleral lenses. In fact, when, when I fail a patient, I can't get them to where I need to be. I refer them to one of my colleagues who fits scleral lenses and they solve them. So this is the ultimate treatment, even beyond all the things that I went over. But just to round things off in the last five minutes before I take some questions here, there is a mucin deficient form of dry eye noted by conjunctival staining. Best pro there is a good example. Sometimes they get filaments we talked about too, but the best for this are HA drops and especially vitamin A gel or ointment. In fact, it revitalizes the goblet cells better than anything I've ever seen. And I know it's supposed to be used at night, but I haven't used it at night and morning or even three times a day. And I get wonderful results on con staining. And finally, people with morning symptoms have what? They have exposure-related dry eye disease, also known as inadequate lid seal. Darken your lane, grab a pen light, look for light coming out. That should be sealed. And I tell patients, you don't have lag of thumbs. You don't have an eyelid up here and down here. <clears throat> you have this kind of opening. But whether your eyelids are open this or this way, you still dry out and we need to solve that problem. And so this is called the, this is the algorithm for inadequate lid seal. Get the eyelids closed, treat the evaporation. Most of these patients have demodex or blepharitis because they probably aren't clearing it off at night and they have inflammation, slightly different algorithm. One of the best, this is actually approved for this condition or available for this condition. This is called a, a night seal. It's hypoallergenic, oxygen permeable, latex-free, 
designed to anatomically close the eyes. Because if you use the sleep mask, you can never get it tight enough to anatomically close the eyes. There's benefit to sleep masks like the ceiling fan air won't get in the eye, but it's not anatomically closing their eyes. If they're able to do this, everything else goes away. I often get patients off all their drops. Ointments are wonderful, whether medicated ointments like a steroid short term or bland ointments. Ultimately, you have to do a lot of good education. Best education tools are things like animations, slit lamp photos that you can show patients what they have, like collarettes. And don't forget the whole contact lens side too. We went into dry eye and all the management of it, and we made it a little bit more. I'm going to go into this in the future for you in a much more detailed way, I promise. I want to give you the intro, but I couldn't make it any simpler in the sense that, I, that I'd be disingenuous and not saying there are different forms of dry eye. And, I, and I've been doing this for almost 30 years. I realized my success has come from identifying which is which, and there's not just one treatment. Each one has its own algorithm. Once you do get things controlled, though, yeah, change the modality. Go to a daily disposable contact lens. Use contact lens solutions that have HA in them. Those are the, well, they're the number one solution anyways, but that's why it has HA in it. Consider contact lenses that have 16 hours of comfort. I've seen some of those designs. Um, for IOLs, look for biometry. Make sure you get it right by controlling the dry eye ahead of time. Remember, 81% of patients had significant dry eye going into that clinic for cataract surgery. Only 22% were diagnosed. I would never do a multifocal on a chronic dry eye patient. I, I'm going to get aberrations in a dry eye person. That's the last thing I need. I would use something like a light adjustable lens. There's a perfect option because if they have instability, I get to adjust it after the fact. Those would be much better choices. So let me get to some questions uh, for sure. OSD affects contact lenses, cataract spectacles. You got to start with the eyelid if you're going to have any sort of survival guide to managing these patients. Use easy algorithmic diagnostic uh, tools such as, hey, what are the questions triaging? What are the side effects? Do I have symptoms? Do I have a sign? Yep. Okay, now what type of dry eye do I have? If it's MGD, that's evaporative. Thin tear meniscus, that's aqueous. Staining on the conch, that's mucin deficient and the eyes don't seal or have morning symptoms, that's exposure or ILS. Then you know how to tackle it because each one you can direct the treatments for, such as the blepharitis and things we talked about. And that's your algorithm. And you got new stuff now that makes all of this so much easier. I get much greater success today by using the Lodalanner 0.25% for Demodex blepharitis than I ever had with light treatments, even though those work. It's just been so much easier. And then you got to communicate it to be effective.